Okay, good morning to everyone. They say uh, that we are in progress of recording. Welcome to our Zoomers, our people at home or uh, in the local pub. The, um, what we're up to is discussion perhaps for chapter 18. Uh, am I correct? Yeah. You see, uh, we're, we're moving fast here because uh, as we enter into in a couple of weeks, Lent and things like that, we should be done right on time because as I told you, and you can see in your outline that we have, as we get closer and closer towards the end, we're going to be doubling up on the material. And uh, because first of all, we would have had some skills already, both from the fall session and this session, we would have had some skills in you know uh, paying attention to you know the Pauline uh, understanding of, of life. Uh, it's amazing when you think about these various things where they just tell us about where he was at a particular time and place. Uh, but the question is, how did he get there? And you know these boat rides were not. Uh, uh, an easy thing. It wasn't like you're going on a cruise liner. Uh, you were seated uh, up. You weren't even seated. You were upstairs uh, on the top of the bow or the back where the uh, lavatory was. And uh, you brought sandwiches and other things with you and water to drink. Uh, about four to five months out of the year, the sea was navigable, navigable. Uh, but other than that, there were, it was dangerous. Paul, you know, in one writing, let's slip that he was three times uh, crashed with a sailboat or a, a regular boat. And then, of course, the one time, the fourth time, is the one where he lands up in Malta, uh, where he very well could have died. Any one of these places he could have died, you know, in the, in the ride, uh, in the boat. And, and actually, in the, in the one that he was going to uh, Rome and they ended up in Malta, uh, the guards actually got along well with Paul and uh, they weren't there to punish or to do anything else. And so it seems like if you read between the lines that they had, you know, kind of a respect for Paul, not because of his teaching or anything, just because he was a gentleman and a good person. So with that in mind, you can see we have some what we call discussion prompts for chapter 18. These are like questions that we should be able to answer. Uh, when we get finished with this, our lesson for today. For example, how did Paul make a living? How could the image of a tent apply to the missionary activity of Paul? Well, those are two statements that build on each other. How did he make a living? Well, you know, in Corinth, uh, there are um, games, Corinthian games, every two years. And every four years, they had some kind of an Olympiad. And this is the time of Christ right after the time of Christ. And so when Paul is there uh, doing this, he, he goes to his, he doesn't want to be beholden to anybody giving him, uh, although he does take rooms at various places, but he doesn't, uh, he's not there to kind of like uh, leech off people. He wants to be self-standing because that would be the way the, the Lord would say uh, that you're not in it for yourself, uh, you're in it for us. And uh, so, uh, and he meets Prisca, Priscilla, Prisca and Aquila, who also are tent makers. Obviously, uh, if a tent is a very uh, holy kind of uh, symbol, is it not? And you can all say, yes, yes, okay, I got that. Yes, very good, very good. And almost universal approval uh, because of the fact that that's how they lived in the desert. You didn't build mud houses or other type things, you lived in a tent. And this, the big tent was the tent that held the Ark of the Covenant. And it had, uh, let's say that this was the temple area. Around each wall here would be a poles holding up skins. Uh, these skins could fit right on camels or other animals and then come around the side and then you would enter here and you would come in and there'd be a place there for sacrifice. There'd be a place for washing. Then there would be a, a closed door up there and then you go into the Holy of Holies and in there you could go further into the Holy of Holies to encounter the living God. So that's exactly the model for the stone building of the temple in the Jerusalem. So when they're in uh, 1350 or so, and some uh, 400 years later, there is a temple built there by Solomon uh, in Jerusalem. And then after that's destroyed, then it starts up again. And that is in the about 40 years, well, let's not even go that far. 30 years before Christ, when Herod the Great starts to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And uh, am I 
on target so far. Okay, this, this is my resource. <laughs> so, uh, um, oh, there you go. Yeah, we, we, I have several books on the building of these uh, temples. The, the, the uh, projects in those days, you know, as there were, there were seven wonders of the ancient world and uh, each one of them uh, was not a natural thing. It was, they were all built like the temple of Diana, Artemis at Ephesus, the temple of Zeus in Greece, uh, the guy named uh, Mausolus lost his wife. So he built her a big, huge, beautiful building with layers of gardens and things like that. And that's where we get the word mausoleum from, is from that particular thing. You have a library in Alexandria, you have a, a great uh, statue of the uh, at Rose, where you have a giant statue. Some people are irre irreverent and they say, well, no, what happened at Rose was that the, the temple, the, uh, the, the figure that they carved had his legs splayed like this so that the sh ship sailed underneath his open leg. And, uh, that is a little bit uh, tough to understand how they could have such a indignified thing if you're gonna build a great big, huge stone artifact, artifact, you know? And the idea was something that big is that it's going to be um, a signal to the people offshore, you know, coming in with their boats and stuff like that. Well, like a, in, uh, in um, Cairo, uh, or Alexandria, they had the, the great um, uh, uh, signal there that, that went out to people and, and stuff like that. Now th that actually, they have undercovered, uh, but uh, uncovered, I should say, uh, but it was covered over and it was underneath the silt of the bottom of the, of the ocean, there the sea. So it's only been in the recent, you know, uh, our lifetime that they've been able to get down and start digging around to find out the stuff that fall into uh, you know, from the uh, uh, lighthouse at Alexandria, uh, which people could see from far off. So we're sort of off track. And uh, you say, if that's the way it's going to be this morning, we better uh, order our sandwiches now. Uh, you know, so, well, so they come. You know, so. Second, Paul makes a significant decision to focus his efforts on the Gentile community. Well, that should be obvious to us by now, right? How does God encourage Paul in his discouragement? And we'll find out the answer to that. Has there ever been a time in your life when you felt encouraged by God in the midst of discouragement? Uh, I would hope that you would not be discouraged, but if you were, that you would be encouraged by the Holy Spirit. Uh, I remember that in our family, one of our family members, uh, he just started to go to Mass every day uh, at the Cathedral of St. Raymond, not because there was anything that we as children knew about, but just because of the fact that it was a time, that was a place to go. Why did uh, Gallio refuse to hear the case against Paul? That's fairly obvious for us. How do Priscilla and Aquila help the cause of the gospel? And who was Apollos? So these are things we will be able to find out when we get through to the text. Now to get through to the text, we have an essay, a kind of introduction, and it says how to read Acts 18. Corinth is a fascinating metropolis in Paul's time. Metra, of course, is big, and Polis is city. And uh, as a trade market, healing center, pagan worship in various uh, places, sexual paradise, the Las Vegas of our times, the Roman prize of wealth, a comb to Jewish dispossessed from Rome. Remember, they had thrown the Jews out of Rome at this time. That's how Priscilla and Aquila end up here. And the reason they got thrown out was because they wanted to have somebody to blame for some things. So get rid of the Jews. Uh, our country now has gone into, uh, so has uh, Europe, a very anti-Semitic attitude in many places. If you go to the boards and uh, financial centers of most of the major uh, universities, private university, I should say, they, they have pulled all their investments in Israel out, their money out and stuff like that, because they feel that the Israelis are punishing the Palestinians, the Palestinians who, uh, along with four other armies, attacked them in the year 1948. And then in 1967, there was another war. And so anyway, that's a, uh, an aside. Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, let's continue. Paul will spend 18 months there, the longest of any of his church foundings. He's going to eventually get a, 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 
three years in uh, Ephesus. He supported himself when needed by working with goatskins, leather, and other elements. Now, leather you would have to tan, and what to do that is a horrible thing, what a stench it makes, because you take the skin and you scrape the fat off, then you put it into uh, water and you boil that stuff. Then you finally take some lye, uh, a potion, and you, and you stick it in there, and just all the drippings and stuff come up. So by the time you get done, I should have brought one down. I have scripts from uh, animal skins uh, from the uh, 1000s and 1100s, uh, 1100, 1200, excuse me. Uh, it's easy for me to just mix up my uh, uh, centuries. I've been in so many of them. So um, you don't think that's the only life I've lived. So uh, anyway, uh, and, and, and they're, they're, they're thin. You know, it's not like, you know, they're rough kind of things where you're, you know, like a bear skin. You're not writing, you know, writing on that. You're writing on something. Some of them are as fine as your paperwork um, and others are a little bit stronger. But the ones that I have are, are still in good shape. You can read that they have, it's Gregorian chant, so you can read it very, very clearly. So let's continue. So uh, now the, the elements of uh, ghost skins are, are good because of the fact that they have oil in them. So when rains come and stuff, you can be in a goat skin on a hot day and inside it's cool uh, because there's little pores come in and stuff like that. And on a rainy day, you're dry because the stuff of the, uh, hits the oily skin and flows off. So there were athletic uh, displays every two years, the Corinthian games. So there, you know, you might need a purse, you might need a saddle, you might need uh, stirrups for your horse, uh, you might need all kinds of things. And so they could use tents and other such items. In other words, where do you stay? They didn't have any Hiltons uh, in uh, Greece at that time. And so uh, what you did was you set up big, now for them, tents were like African tents. They weren't just little pup tents, you know, like a V shape. They were great big, huge mounds type things like this. And they would be covered with the goat skins all the way around. And so, so when you're walking in, you're actually walking in and maybe the top of the tent is at least this tall and, uh, and spacious inside so you could sleep a lot of people. So anyway, uh, he was able to leave behind there a community that would be troubled over more issues than any other that which he could write. See, when he writes his two letters to the Corinthians and the scholars would say, actually, there's about five letters and they jammed him into two. So you have to be careful. If you read Corinthians 1, you just go from one problem to another problem to another problem. At the same time, you have beautiful and wonderful thoughts. Go to the end of chapter 12 and beginning of 13 in Corinthians. What do you get? Love is kind. Love is not rude. You know, how many weddings does that occur at? Well, about 90%, I would say. They pick that beautiful reading from uh, uh, Corinthians uh, because that's what, you know, it's a description of love in, in the Christian mode. So uh, anyway, uh, but, but there's one issue after another, after another. Uh, in the second letter is a little bit more personal, gets a little bit more homey. Um, so he said there would be trouble more issues than any other, which he from Aquila and Priscilla, Prisca, who we met in Corinth and who would sail with him to Ephesus to become lifelong friends and co-workers, both at Ephesus and in Rome. So you see what's happened there. They're going to start naming some of the people who accompany Paul as an entourage. He might have had, uh, rough guess, 70 or so people at a time that followed with him. So it wasn't like Paul and a few buddies, you know, stopping off. Uh, it was uh, it just, it was a kind of a moving cell of uh, religiosity. So, uh, and, but they do mention some names here. I, I told you before, if you wanted to get all the names that were used by uh, Paul in the, the uh, uh, as Luke recorded it, you might get up about 70 or 80 names and a good number of them were women. Uh, anyway, uh, and they became lifelong friends, co-workers both at Ephesus and Rome. He would be sponsored by a generous gentleman named Titus Justus, who was a Christian there in Corinth. And so what he does, he says, Paul, come and stay with us. And uh, a synagogue official, uh, Paul would preach at the nearby synagogue, I should say, on the Sabbath, trying to convert both Jews and Gentiles, he did not take lightly to rejection. A synagogue official was converted with household for sure. Now, Gallio was the proconsul. And uh, there is a place now, and you, if, as you walk through Corinth, because they've excavated it, uh, you would find a platform. The platform is about as high as this wall over here, you know, this basement building. So, and uh, there up on top would stand the proconsul. And it's still there to this day. And then people would come from down below. They didn't want to have the proconsul threatened in any manner, so they have you know guards all over the place. 
And so, but they bring Paul out to be uh, censured. Uh, and it's the Jewish people who want him censured because he's against their religious understanding. And so uh, when uh, Paul would preach at the nearby synagogue, trying to convert both Jews and Greeks, he didn't take lightly. A synagogue official was converted household for sure. Gallio would serve as proconsul, and the Jews appeared before him as he stood on a huge stone platform extant to this day. He turned the Jews down because he didn't get into religious doctrines. Now this, uh, you know, it, Luke is very careful here. This is something we don't need to hear about or learn about, but you say, well, if he was brought before the proconsul, what, what, what's he gonna judge Paul on? Well, proconsul has got that figured out. I'm not gonna judge it on Paul because I don't wanna get involved in religious people's practice. Even now, before some of the courts in the United States, if people come in with religious things, says so-and-so bishop fired so-and-so priest or so-and-so priest fired so-and-so principal of a school or something like that, and then, then be in a Catholic school. And so anyway, they bring it up for uh, judgment, uh, you know, kind of sue people and stuff. And they said, we're not gonna get into that because that's a, the, that's a separation of religion and state covers a lot of these type of uh, lawsuits. Not all of them. He turned the Jews down because he didn't get any religious doctrines. He says they vented a synagogue official. So in other words, they can't beat up Paul. So what do they do? They take the synagogue official and, and wail on him. <laughs> now Paul would leave Corinth and with Prisca and sail in the direction of Syria, uh, not, not in, in the direction of Syria, but landed at Ephesus for a brief time. See, you know, on your map there, you just go straight across from Corinth to Ephesus, same uh, uh, longitude there, whatever you call it. And then, and, but uh, they were supposed to be going down into uh, Israel. So uh, they vented on a, uh, so now Paul would leave Corinth with Prisca and Ecclesail. Uh, F-I-N, oh yes, that was it. I, I forgot to tip the newspaper kid. And, um, you know, and this, uh, so I, the fin came in there. And it was sitting on my desk, a fin, you know, to get to them. So, you know, we all make mistakes. Um, this one was a computer mistake, obviously. They wanted him to stay to learn more about Christ, but he promised to return to Ephesus, which he did. He set foot on the ground at Caesarea, you know, named after Caesar. And of course, this is where uh, the Romans uh, set up their headquarters. So there are several legions that are there in uh, Caesarea itself. I've told you already over and over, let's imagine that this is the land here and this is the Mediterranean out there, right where you are seated is an opening, but this is a wall that they put out kind of like a great big crab, you know, kind of claws coming out like this. And there is where the boats could come in. The obvious reason for that is that with all the heavy waves and stuff like that that would be coming in and the ships bouncing and stuff if you tried to unload them. So what they did was they built this kind of con in the, in the midst of this. And uh, anyway, this was named after Caesarea. You named a lot of things after Caesarea. We just mentioned in our uh, morning mass, uh, Jesus starts his journey to Jerusalem, not by going south, but by going up into the far northeastern corner because uh, it was Dan to Beersheba. But he goes beyond that because he wants to have a kind of an introduction to the world beyond Judaism and his journey to Jerusalem. And at the same time, uh, he wanted to show that he was, in, in, was going to speak to all people of Israel. And so he comes down, and he goes up to that place, and, and uh, sure enough, it's called Caesarea Philippi. Philip was the son of Herod, and he gets one big chunk when Herod dies. They, they split it up among four people. The one over by Caesarea Philippi was a dud, and uh, you get those in politics at times. But then you get, uh, you know, the other brothers were up here. Uh, in the north or on the east. And uh, so the one who was a dud is replaced by a Caesar official, Julius Caesar, at the time of Jesus. So anyway, uh, so uh, that's that's how it gets its name. Uh, and uh, Caesarea gets the name because uh, Herod wanted to give, uh, because he's doing a lot of this building, he wanted to be sure to let the Romans know that he's on their side and they should be on his side. And so uh, they, they wanted uh, Paul to, help them to return more about Christ. They couldn't get enough. They were hungering for Christ. It's like one of those Psalms, I hunger, like a deer hungers for, you know, thirsty deer hungers for water, flowing water, uh, that's Psalm 42. And, uh, and next he went down to Antioch. See, <laughs> he leaves Jerusalem and goes down, which means he goes north. And without solidifying his itinerary, he went through Gal Galatia now. So he, he's really going quick here. Because what he does when he gets up to Antioch, he just turn uh, to your left if you're facing north, 
uh, and uh, you, you know, uh, the, the land of the setting sun is to your left and the rising sun to your right. And so he goes to Galatia, which is the southeast corner, along with Cilicia uh, of uh, Turkey. Now, do you, you recall, does that sound familiar to you, Galatia? Doesn't Paul write a letter to the Galatians? Uh, yes, he does. And in fact, they were Celtic. Uh, so that was the uh, transposition from there up to Northern France and then to Northern Scotland and then to Ireland. Uh, in the millennia to come, the Celtic people moved out of Galatia and inhabited Ireland. <clears throat> so next he went to Antioch, says back in Ephesus, the most important city of the Roman Empire, uh, Roman province of Asia, I should say province of Asia. See, uh, everything here is divided in, by, into provinces. So a Jew from Alexandria named Apollos was nurtured by Prisca and Aquila. Oh, this is good. So he comes up from Alexandria, Egypt. Now, is there a uh, church in Alexandria? There are many uh, legends about this. Some one legend, I'll just tell you, and you say, oh, that's a legend. We don't know for sure, is Mark. And Mark you know, goes across the northern part of Africa. As you know, Mark is buried in Venice. Have you ever been to Venice for the great church of St. Mark there? Well, he's buried there. You say, I thought you said he came from, uh, from uh, Northern Africa. Yes, he did. And his bones were there. But they wanted to put him into the cathedral uh, in Venice, St. Mark's Cathedral. So what they did, because they're sharp people, is they took his coffin, put the remains in the coffin, and covered it with pig slabs and covered it over and they put it, they come to the ship and it's all nailed down. They look inside and it's got pig fat. <laughs> so the, the uh, Jews are not too sharp on pig. <clears throat> so anyway, they sneak the body across, hose it down and there you go, they're all set. You say that doesn't really mean anything to us at the moment because we're trying to read about the time of Paul. Uh, okay, I hear what you said. So. Uh, um, I won't say it again. So anyway, now uh, Apollos is nurtured along. Why? Because he has this baptism of John the Baptist. John the Baptist uh, baptizes people. He even baptized Jews, not to Christianity, but, but his washing in the River Jordan uh, and, uh, it was to cleanse people. So for him, uh, baptism was a cleansing of all your impurities. That's why a small version of the baptism in a flowing river is a mishka, which is a giant bathtub. So you walk down some steps, uh, you're, you're, you're clothed because that's the in light stuff, because that's the way they do things. So you go down into the water. You couldn't, if you were a rabbi, you couldn't get into the temple unless you went down and went through the, uh, the uh, cleansing first. And then you would go up on the top. Okay, so that's what's uh, happening here too is that Paul is baptizing. So when it comes time to baptize in Christ, which he says, uh, there is someone coming who is stronger than I, uh, and that he's talking about Jesus. And uh, so uh, what he does, John the Baptist baptizing with water is a baptism, but then there's going to be a need uh, to bring in the Holy Spirit because that's what happens to the apostles of Pentecost, is it not? So we have like a private Pentecost at the time of these baptisms. So Apollos comes and they say, are you baptized? He said, sure, I was baptized by the followers of John the Baptist. Well, time out, time out. That doesn't work. Uh, that is that baptism. <laughs> we need to have the more complete baptism, which is baptism in the spirit. And remember at Pentecost, they had a flame up above. What's that's a symbol of? Yes, you're right. The Holy Spirit, almost universal acclamation. I felt it. I felt, you know. Okay. So anyway, he was nurtured by Prisca and Aquila about the need to go beyond John the Baptist baptism waters. That means he is going to be rebaptized. No, it means he's going to be added to his baptism. Just like we would have it nowadays that in the Roman uh, liturgy, uh, the, because the uh, um, Orthodox liturgy is different because uh, they give a lot of sacraments right away, you know, and they would give confirmation uh, perhaps. And they would also give Eucharist and stuff to the baby. The baby doesn't understand any of this, but that's what they do. And so, and that, that could be accurate here, but we have a, you know, like in late grade school or early high school, we have a confirmation and the, the bishop gives you a light tap on the cheek. You know, you're gonna go through suffering and says, I, I give you the Holy Spirit. So since he would be a valuable addition to the community, 
most likely X singles him out to be an example for other Christians. The spirit reigns. Paul will stay in Ephesus for three years. Ask the speaker for more information about his stay. Did that mean you? Well, well, oh, yeah. What would you like to know? He uh, goes next to one of the synagogue places and, and soon gets thrown out. And so what he does is he, he has a, a man there. He's given a name of Tyrannus. And uh, if you went to the library in Ephesus, now it's been excavated, you will see not a plaque, but kind of a stone, chiseled stone, if I have it correct in my memory, it could be a bronze thing. But anyway, it lists the patrons who put the money into this magnificent library building. And you see the library building a lot, a lot of times because they show that when you show us something about Ephesus because it's a big tall building and it has pillars and stuff like that. And they put images in those pillars. So they have the stonework there of all these famous people. Uh, so, but they have a, a list there of the people paid money and sure enough, Tyrannus's name is on it. So here you got the person of wealth uh, taking Paul in. Uh, I've told you umpteen times because it reflects good on me and you know, Hickel was just bursting forth. How I had a, a kind of a, a thrill of my trip uh, was to be able to sit down with the head Muslim, head architect of the excavation uh, of uh, Ephesus. I was there in 1990 and the whole hillside here going up on the west side was covered with dirt and stuff uh, of detritus from the earthquakes and other things like that. And down at the bottom, they had a row of fancy houses. Well, now they have actually moved up in 19 or 2017 is when I went, I believe. And then uh, you go up to the top and uh, you can look down and you can see the whole side of the hill there is these mansions. Now they don't have streets, you know, with stoplights and all that kind of stuff. They haven't got a hold of that, that you can have people mistakenly go through a red light and then charge you a hundred bucks. That's a different story. Okay, uh, so what, what they have is like alleyways that go between these giant houses. Uh, one of the houses would be, uh, have a courtyard that was almost like a small gymnasium. And, uh, and these were open to the top and a lot of them had pools in the, in the center. And uh, then as you came into this giant place, Tyrannus gave Paul the use of one of those great halls in his house uh, to, uh, for a school. So Paul's going to set up his school and that school is going to still go from like 11 o'clock to four o'clock. You say, whoa, that's kind of the heat of the day. Yes, well, that's precisely why he did it because people go to work in the morning during you know, kind of a cooler hour. They go do some of their work in the evening. That's you can do shopping and other type things in the, in the evening. That'd be like the late afternoon. But you know, in the middle of the day, a lot of people in the Mediterranean area would take a snooze or a kind of cooling off, just kind of calming down because of the heat. Uh, the heat is not oppressive there, like it might be in, in uh, you know, the, the, uh, California or some New Mexico or something like that. Uh, it's, um, I was in Israel from August to December, and I think every single day, with a few exceptions, the temperature was 79 degrees. So every day you say, how warm is the day? 79 degrees. I say, where'd you find that? I says, well, because for the last six weeks, it's been 79 degrees. So um, anyway, uh, we're a little bit off target. In, in, um, so what, what's happening here is uh, that Paul is staying there and he's uh, becoming a teacher. You say, well, is there any benefit of that? Now, Luke doesn't tell us that, but here is the benefit of Paul. Uh, from there, he's going to write some letters uh, back to uh, like uh, uh, Corinth and other places. And uh, in doing so, he's going to be communicating what the faith is about and some of the problems of the church. Like Thessalonica has a big problem. They think that if you uh, uh, were with the Christ that you are going to now ascend to heaven because Christ is going to come and take his faithful to heaven. And you say, but my, my uh, uh, brother died. Uh, my uncle died. Our kids died, something like that. And uh, what's going to happen with them if they go into Netherland or something? And so Paul has to tell them about uh, the resurrection and what it, <clears throat> excuse me, what it means in its fullest. Uh, so, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Excuse me. It was because I sneezed two weeks ago that I went to get my COVID check once more. 
just because they say sneezing is one of the symptoms. Uh, since I'm a very generous person, a group of fleas had set up a house in my nose and that caused, so anyway, I, uh, I went and I, sure enough, I got the COVID test and they said, you know, you're negative. So that was good. I also told them, I said, there's a lot of people think I'm negative. So, um, you yeah, know, okay. So uh, anyway, uh, what, what's happening is with uh, this, uh, this conversation I had with this gentleman lasted an hour. My colleagues from the Bill of Archaeology Society were up in the hills because he wanted to find a cave there that had some uh, Christian scribblings, probably early masses. And so uh, we had a great uh, conversation. This man was so kind and so enthusiastic. I asked two questions. Uh, one took a half hour answer. Two took another half hour answer. So we had one whole hour in which I asked two questions. And he was just as excited as could be. One of the questions was, you've excavated this part so much, what are you going to do with that hill over there? So they started explaining you know, how they do it, all this stuff. Anyway, that's a different story. So uh, what, we're, what we're doing now is on the next page, I've given you a thing from who's who in the New Testament. It's one of those study books that you would have. And it's like a, an encyclopedia. And they have, it's a thick book because they have a lot. So here is a description of Aquila and then her husband. Uh, so uh, Priscilla and Aquila, I should say. And then if you take a look, you can see down there a modern canal down there in our map, an ancient wall, ancient Corinth over here on the left. And you can see the ancient Corinth that's uh, actually up, that's kind of north. And uh, what's down on the east side there is Kincray. And Kincray is uh, a place of uh, like where the ships uh, would be and what they would do is unload their stuff and you can see then they had to take it up a hill. Well, they did that for a lot of these places, especially like if you go to Croatia or Yugoslavia, nobody builds on the lake on the waterfront. Why? Because that's where the pirates came. And uh, if you were up on the hill, you had at least some defense. Okay, now we're going to turn the page. And as you can see, we have one full page here of biblical text and several notes on the side. But you should be uh, very conversant with what's going to take place here because uh, we've already talked about it at, this, at the gist of it. So let's take a look. I have to put the pages down here because I don't want to block out our beloved uh, distant learners. Uh, so chapter 18, Paul in Corinth. Uh, and I put up there, I says, Paul developed and develops a circle of friends, some for life. By that, we mean that we are here now in, in the 50s. And so Paul is going to be executed in the 60s. And so these are people who will be with Paul from the beginning of their contact with Paul, all the way up until the time when Paul is executed uh, outside the city. Uh, he was held in uh, house arrest for a long time, a couple of years, in fact, in one state. And then he was put into uh, prison and uh, that was the Mamertine prison, uh, which was a hell hole, literally a hole that your worst criminals were in a circular um, hole in the ground with a grate over the top, not uh, some kind of luxury cell where you could stretch out and think. So after this, uh, so uh, anyway, uh, and I put on the right-hand side, just what I commented on before here, Paul will write the very first of the Christian writings, first Thessalonians, the oldest preserved Christian writing. He will later write much correspondence. Uh, so uh, now you see by this, see, we think that, you know, the gospels are first and then the letters and stuff like that. Well, it doesn't quite work that way. We have many of the letters come out uh, before uh, the uh, gospels because Mark writes his gospel. It is published in the year 70. Uh, Matthew would be in uh, 80, Luke 85. And then after that, the Acts of the Apostles and then John. So he left Athens and went to Corinth. So there he meets Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. He went to visit them. Why would he do that? Well, because they are already converts. So this gives you kind of a behind the scenes thing if you wanted to fill this out, that there already is a church in Rome. It's not that when Paul comes in, 
uh, he uh, initiates the church in Rome. In fact, in the movies, when they show these movie type things, uh, they have Paul walking with his entourage. He's, uh, you know, gotten out of Malta and stuff like that because he got a ship now after he landed there after the crash. And he comes up on the uh, western side of Italy. And uh, at each place that he goes, he gets a big crowd. People have heard Paul is coming. Paul is coming. Well, do they have his letter yet? No. Uh, but they know that Paul is coming. He's the, the treasured saint of them because he was uh, a complete convert and uh, is coming to them. And so, uh, and I put down that it was around 40 AD that the Jews have to leave uh, Rome. Anyway, he practiced the same trade, stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers. I put down that, so, okay. Then I put down verse four, every Sabbath he entered into discussion in the synagogue. You say, well, that's, that's the pattern. He's gonna follow the same pattern he did on his first missionary journey. Second missionary journey is uh, gonna do the same attempting to convince both Jews and Greeks. So when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, what were they doing up there? Well, Paul left them behind at Philippi and Berea and Thessalonica because of the fact that he needed uh, to move on himself. They weren't as much after his disciples as they were after him. And so anyway, uh, they came down from Macedonia. Paul began to occupy himself totally with preaching the word. In other words, they could take care of some of the uh, regular business testifying to the Jews that Messiah was Jesus. When they opposed him and reviled him, he shook out his garments, said to them, your blood on your heads. I am a clear responsibility now when I go to the Gentiles. So he left there and went to the house belonging to a man uh, named Titus Eustace, a worshiper of God. His house was next to the synagogue. Well, eventually he's gonna have to move. So uh, anyway, Crispus, the synagogue official, came to believe in the Lord with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians who heard believed and were baptized. So here you get the synagogue official right next to the synagogue. And then you have this Crispus, who is, you know, the kind of like the, uh, we, we would call it the uh, CEO or something like that of the synagogue. Uh, I had hired, by the way, at the Carmel Catholic in Lundelein, a gentleman who was a Jew. And he was the president of the uh, Skokie Jewish uh, synagogue. And uh, he was a history teacher. He had become very successful in his work. The marvelous gentleman, uh, uh, successful in his work. Uh, had several companies and at the age of 50, he decided to forget it. He went back to Michigan State, got a, a second degree, which was a, a master's in history. Came and uh, wanted to talk to, you know, one of the leading educators of, oh, I'm sorry. I wanted to talk to me. And um, so it's, he was a wonderful gentleman and he stayed with there all these years, just uh, I think retired a year or two ago. He's a great friend of mine. And, uh, uh, just as an aside, okay, his father died. And so a group of us went to the funeral held at a synagogue, which was like a movie theater. There was no altar or anything like that. It was just a theater. So he's sitting rows there and stuff like that. And the rabbi came out and he gave a very nice talk, you know, but it wasn't like a eulogy, you know, about that he knew the father and all that kind of stuff. He, so he, he didn't get into that. It wasn't a eulogy. Uh, it was an explanation of afterlife. And here's what his explanation was. It came straight out of the book of Plato. Because Plato said, remember, when we die, our soul goes to heaven. Well, I, I, when you think about the reality of that, how do the souls get around? And how do you know it's a soul and not a cloud? Uh, how do you know it's a soul and uh, it's not a relative? The, you know, so uh, what, what's the second last line of our Nicene Creed? I believe in the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. So that is what we have is how did Jesus go into heaven? He went into heaven as the glorified Jesus resurrection body. And that's what is awaiting us. And uh, consequently, there's, a, uh, there's tons of books on all of that. And so uh, anyway, uh, then the synagogue official came to believe along with the tire says, one night, he says that many of the Corinthians who heard believed and were baptized. See, so Paul's uh, having some effect. One night in a vision, the Lord said to Paul, and I put on the side, Paul needs this affirmation. And I said, so do we. There are times when we are discouraged in life. It doesn't seem like we have any hope or stuff. Maybe even just the virus could be a dead end for us because what did we do to deserve this? That across the planet, everybody would get this pandemic starting from a small area of uh, China. 
and says, don't be afraid. Go on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No, no one will attack and harm you, for I have many people in this city. Wow, exclamation point in quotation marks. He settled there for a year and a half and taught the word of God among them. So this is one of the interesting parts of Paul's journey. Uh, the other places, remember in the first uh, place when he went to uh, uh, Antioch of Pisidia, and then he went to Iconium, and then to Lystra, and then to uh, Derbe, and then uh, reversed himself and went back again and stuff. So that might have taken a year and a half to do the whole thing, but he didn't stay at any place for a long enough time uh, because he had other places to go. And that's where Timothy comes from, by the way. So what, what happens now is that Paul is kind of ensconced in this area, and he's going to stay there uh, so that the people have a thorough grounding. One of the problems of the early church is because things weren't written down and you didn't have a book on the side like a creeft or a, you know somebody else or Bishop Barron's talks or something like that to tell you what Christianity is all about nowadays. You didn't have that. What you had was oral tradition being passed on orally. And uh, even though these letters would go out in written form and they would go to all the various cities and stuff like that, like, like when Paul writes the, to Corinthians, it just doesn't stay in Corinth. They don't say, well, okay, now we've read his letter, give us another. No, it, uh, that goes to the other cities. And so all of a sudden, the, the, the uh, Christianity is spreading by the fact that these uh, uh, texts are telling us what Christ is about. So uh, when all this takes place, uh, we have uh, Paul staying someplace because he wants to have a school. And here's what happens. Many of the people that he taught here and in Ephesus, more especially in Ephesus, uh, they would study under Paul and then they would go out to the various cities. Like when he's in Ephesus and he stays there for three years, he sends people out to the various towns that are in the book of Revelation. If you go to chapter two in the book of Revelation, you get seven cities there, like Pergamon, Smyrna, uh, you know, and uh, the, the, the famous Thyatira, uh, Philadelphia. Uh, so you get these uh, 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 letters going out to all these different communities. It's like a, like their their form of a very slow uh, phone message. So when Gal uh, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, now he was there. Uh, the they have figured out by records in the year 50, 51, and fifty two. So this is before Nero, and even when Nero became the uh, emperor. Uh, he, he was mild uh, to the Christians. He, he didn't care because there's so many religions around. He didn't care. It's just another one. However, he wants to have the center area of Rome for himself to build a new agora and have all the great buildings there. So he wants to build a new city. Like So he has to destroy the old. How does he do it? He bombs it with fire. And uh, in those days, more or less, a lot of the wood goes into things. Like I think I mentioned this the other day. That when they're, they're rebuilding now in uh, Notre Dame in France, and they need support stuff on the inside. Of course, they got a lot of stone on the outside. And of course, they had a big fire there. So, you know, you know but they, they are putting in 800 tons of wood into the reconstruction of Notre Dame, stuff that's going to be hidden from people's view. So uh, anyway, that's what, what happens here. And so, so now he, he uh, uh, you know, uh, and somebody wrote in one of their letters that he was fiddling. And so uh, he takes a lot of, no pun intended, takes a lot of heat. And so what he does is he puts it on the Christians. He said, oh, yeah, that group that came in here, they did it. And so, you know, that's where the persecution started. So anyway, um, when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, that's Athens, the Jews wrote up against Paul and brought him to the tribunal, saying this man is inducing people to worship God contrary to the law. So these people have followed him there. And now what they do is they don't want this infection uh, to take over in uh, court. So when Paul was about to reply, Gallio spoke to the Jews, says, if this matter was of some crime or malicious fraud, I would with reason hear the complaint of you Jews. But since it's a quotation of arguments over doctrine and titles in your own law, see to it yourself. I do not wish to be a judge of such, such matters. Well, we have that today, do we not? You know, with uh, any time court things come up about Catholic institutions, Jewish institutions, other type of things, they have to check first to see whether or not they're violating the separation of church and state. By the way, uh, some of the uh, business in front of the Supreme Court these days is, uh, is very powerful if it can take place. See, like place like Florida, Texas, and Arizona. I 
went out to help out our school in Arizona, which I did for a year and a half. I they called me the head of the school. So anyway, um, and I got them on the right track. And I spent a lot of money doing it, but I raised a lot of money doing it. And uh, they get, uh, you as a taxpayer, state taxpayer, can take off of your state tax a certain amount of money, uh, $500 per person, 10000 for uh, a company. And uh, that brought in some, we, we, our school out there got $900,000 a year and it was taxed money. But uh, the argument of the people in Arizona was, it's a lot cheaper to give up 500 bucks to educate a kid in one of these Catholic schools we're gonna pay tuition as opposed to paying 11 to 12,000 that we pay in the public schools. And by the way, these Catholic schools are exemplary. <laughs> and they're also wide open because we had these students from India, from a Muslim, from other uh, faiths and stuff like that, but it was a, a strong Catholic school. So uh, anyway, uh, now one of the uh, two of the laws that came up before the, uh, the and of course didn't get any press in the paper is that you know there, this uh, separation of church and state does not include us forbidding to give state money to Catholic schools. Now they're never going to do it in Illinois, you know, because uh, they're never going to do it. But there are states that are doing it. Like I say, the, the three mentioned there and others will do it. So what you can do is you can just sign off part of your state tax and then you pay less, but then you get the, the state actually makes a lot of money. I added up one time because I was uh, in the front of the uh, legislature of uh, Illinois. And I mentioned, um, you know, that we support Illinois by at least a billion dollars that you have, don't have to pay because we're educating your children. So um, if I made my point, okay. Should I stick with the material? Oh, oh yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> so easy to push me on to the side. Let's continue. Saying this man is inducing people to worship God contrary to the law. So when Paul was about to reply, Galileo spoke to the Jews. For a matter of some crime or malicious fraud, I wouldn't do it. So anyway, so he, he I, I don't want to be. So anyway, he drove them away from the tribunal. Then they all see Sosthenes, the synagogue official, beat him up in view of the tribunal. But so then he returns to Antioch. How are we doing on time? Do we still have time for the film? We started late, I'm sorry, you know, because yeah, of, yeah because we had the event upstairs, you know, it slowed down our mass. So you're kind. Uh, so anyway, Kinkray, he had his hair cut because he'd taken a vow. People think that was a temporary vow that he had, maybe when he started his missionary journey, because Nazarites do not for their lifetime cut their hair. Remember uh, the son of uh, David, who was uh, trying to kill his father and got hung up in the tree because his hair was so long. Uh, anyway, they asked him to stay for a longer time and discuss all these things with us. And uh, that would be great. And I put some arrows there. See, the first he was supposed to go to Jerusalem, but first he went to Ephesus, then he went to Caesarea, and then finally Jerusalem. Although they asked him to stay for a longer time, he didn't consent, but he said farewell. He says, I should come back to you, God willing. And he set sail from Ephesus. So the question is, wow, did he jump over to Ephesus? And then, uh, you know, because he was just uh, at the Kenkrate, but it says, when they reached Ephesus, he left them there, or he entered the synagogue and held discussion with Jews. So that, that was it. Yes, he did. He went straight across uh, from west to east and uh, into Ephesus, one of the four largest cities of the Roman Empire. And he says, I shall come back to you again, God willing. And then he set sail from Ephesus down to Caesarea, and, uh, and he greeted the church. Now, the church, I put a question mark there. What church is he talking about? The church at Caesarea? Or did he go down to Jerusalem? And then it says he went down to Antioch. It seems that the scholars would say he actually went to Jerusalem. Why they didn't mention more clear in this is um, a mystery. After staying there for some time, he left to travel early, sequence through the Galatian country and Phrygia, bringing strength to all the disciples. So in other words, what he's doing then, he doesn't tell you the interpository things, you know, that are this. He doesn't say, and then he did this, 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 and this. He doesn't have to, he just tells you where he ended up. So he ended up in Caesarea, he greeted the church, and then he went to Antioch and he greeted the church. And then he went through the whole area of Galatia and Cilicia, which is that area southeast corner of Turkey. Then he comes to Apollos, a native of Alexandria, an eloquent speaker right in Ephesus. He was an authority on scriptures. Now, why are they mentioning this particular thing about this baptism? Because there's going to be a lot of people in the church 
uh, that are going to be baptized with the baptism of John the Baptist. And so uh, what Luke wants to do is to be sure that this gets in somehow that has been corrected uh, in, the, in the form of Priscilla and Aquila in, at Ephesus. Uh, let's continue now. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord. See, the way, as the, all you have to do is go to uh, John uh, chapter 14. Uh, says, uh, Jesus says, you uh, have faith in God, have faith in me. There are many mansions in my father's house. If uh, not, were I going to tell you that I was going to take you to be there? Uh, so he said, uh, he, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And uh, so uh, uh, Thomas says, uh, you know, we don't know the way. And so Jesus said, I am the way. Actually, the way, the truth, and the life in Hebrew is the true and living way. The last two words are uh, uh, fit, uh, in, in the position right before uh, the way. So in many of the Christians, because they were embarrassed by the fact that Jesus, the Lord, the Messiah, was crucified, called themselves the way. So the cro cross did not become, you know, the single, uh, in, you know, imperative thing that you have on you as a sign. That was much later, especially with the Jews, if they find out the Messiah was put on a cross and they say, well, this can't be our Messiah. It has to be somebody else. So anyway, he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, but when Priscilla and Aqua heard him, they took him aside, explained to him the way of God more accurately. When he wanted to cross to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him, Achaia's uh, Athens. After his arrival, he gave great assistance to those who had come to believe through grace. Oh, he puts that in there, Luke, doesn't he? All these things are not happenstance. It's not sociology that brings somebody to Christ. It is uh, the Holy Spirit and grace. He vigorously refuted the Jews in public, establishing from the scriptures that the Messiah is Jesus. So quite a bit of um, activity here, right? We start out in Corinth. Uh, we go to uh, uh, Antioch. Uh, we come back. We go out again. And uh, so there's more action coming. That'll be in chapter 19. Now, that answers all the questions that we have on the question page at the beginning. But uh, you might have some observations or questions you'd like to share, please. Uh, the Titus Eustace that we read about is that the Titus that Paul wrote a letter to him? Uh, oh, yes. I'm, 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 yes. I, I would look that up myself. You know, where would I go? I would go to who's who with the <laughs> New Testament. But I, I'll look that up for you. Yes, uh, Titus becomes a companion. And uh, so uh, this, uh, along with Timothy and, and others, the uh, legend, if, you, if what you're saying is, is the accurate uh, description, uh, he becomes uh, the bishop, I believe, of Crete. Uh, Timothy is uh, the bishop of Ephesus. So they, they did have a long time participation in the church. And these are the type of people that would visit Paul when he was in prison waiting his death. Uh, so even Luke is there. So when you see the movies and stuff like that, they will have Paul in like a household, not at the time when he's in the prison, because that's too uh, dank of a experience to show on film. But he is, uh, you know, when he's on under house arrest, they have people come to visit him. They still have a guard out front in the movies, but, you know, they go in and talk with Paul. And so bring him kind of friendship. I have friends who have been in prison. If I flew in one time to see somebody in prison. You say, wow, must be a friend. Yes, yeah, you're right. Anybody else have a, any thoughts? Okay. We are going to have another chapter out of our movie. Are you, are you happy with what we've uh, learned today? So, uh, how would you like to be the travel agent? <laughs> Trying to figure all this out. <laughs> okay. We're going to stop our recording. Thank you for watching. <laughs>